Hello, everybody. With Bob Christopher and Richard Piper, I'm Bob Davis, and this is Basic Gospel, a media ministry dedicated to helping you hear, believe, and live the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, we continue in our Friday series on hard passages. You know, the ones that sometimes uh, uh, kind of tie up even the seasoned Christian and those that even though we have received the grace and life of Jesus Christ, when we read them, they stop us cold. Well, we'll be talking about uh, hard passages, taking a hard look at them on this Friday edition of Basic Gospel. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Let's join Bob Christopher right now. Well, thanks, Bob. Today we're going to tackle three uh, particular passages, and the first that we're going to look at is one that we've been asked about time and time again through 35 years of ministry, 40 years of ministry, actually, and it's the Lord's Prayer. What is the meaning of the Lord's Prayer? And the verse that's really troublesome is this one. It says this, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So see, many people would look at that and say, see, the Lord is saying that we need to ask for forgiveness, that every time we sin, we need to pray this prayer. And we're going to talk about that because that's not what this passage is saying at all. So here's what it says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive, and this is the verses right after the Lord's Prayer where we usually say amen. Yeah, we don't Uh, want to quote this. Yeah, we don't want to go on to this, but here it is. It's right there in the Word of God. This is verses 14 and 15. Jesus said this, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So he gives us an understanding of what he's communicating in the prayer when he encourages us to say, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So what's the context? Well, the context, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. He is teaching this prayer, and he is saying, we don't want you to be like the hypocrites who pray simply to be seen by others. They go out into the synagogues. They go out into the marketplace. They stand at the corners. They pray. They look spiritual. They look holy. People pat them on the back, and Jesus said they've gotten their just reward. That's what they've wanted. When somebody pats them on the back, they've got what they've expected said, so don't pray like that, like the hypocrites, or don't pray like the Gentiles, uh, for they think that in their many words they can get God's attention. And so that's a pagan way of praying, that we have to wake God up, we have to get many voices uh, together in unison so that our words will have importance and God will pay attention, he'll do something on our behalf, and he, he puts that to rest with these words. He already knows what we need even before we ask. And so our asking is simply to connect with the love of God, the care of God, the provision of God that he's already involved in. So don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't pray like the Gentiles. But when you do pray, pray along these lines. So our Father in heaven. So this is a family thing. We have a loving Father who cares for us, who's interested in us. And Jesus' entire ministry was to make the Father known. And so he's trying to do that in in a way here. Uh, But he also has something else in mind. He wants to get down to the heart of every particular person. So if you're going to have a relationship with the Father, you need to be right with the Father. And that's not only externally. uh, We can be clean on the outside. Jesus is saying, well, what about the inside? What about the heart? And so let's go to an issue that's of importance to every single person, and that's forgiveness of sins. And so he says, I want you to ask for forgiveness, but I want that to be conditioned, that ask to be conditioned on your forgiveness of others. So if you're out there forgiving others, then you have the right to ask God, your heavenly father, to forgive you. So that's what he's saying. So forgive us our debt. This request is contingent on our forgiveness of others. So forgiveness from God based on this particular passage is conditional. God will forgive us if we forgive others. Now that's old covenant forgiveness. Uh, Old covenant was always couched in terms of if then. 
If you forgive others, then God is going to forgive you. If you obey all my statutes and commandments, then God will be your people. You will be, um, or he will be your God. So it was always couched in if then. So this particular prayer, this particular uh, line of the prayer is an if then proposition. Yeah. It's a conditional uh, ask. So you can ask if you are out forgiving others. So if that's the case, if your forgiveness is conditional upon your willingness to forgive others, not only your willingness, but your actual action to forgive others, how many of you would be forgiven in the sight of God? How many of you would receive forgiveness of sins? And I doubt very many would raise their hand and say, I've forgiven every single sin that's ever been committed against me. I don't think anybody could say that no. with a straight face. So he's saying, hey, if you want forgiveness, something else has to happen. Something else has to take place. Well, what is that? It has to be the shedding of blood. In Hebrews 9.22, uh, the writer says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Even the old covenant had that yes. as a part of it. They had to offer the blood of bulls and goats in order to receive temporary forgiveness. So without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So Jesus shed his blood on the cross once and for all. What does that mean? All debts have been paid in full. Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe for us who owed a debt that we could not pay. We've heard that time and time again. But the reality of it is that Christ's blood took away sin once and for all. Our accounts payable has been wiped clean. Yeah. His accounts receivable has been wiped clean. There is no debt outstanding. So that's what happened when Jesus shed his blood. He reconciled the world unto himself. So after the cross, so we have a prayer that was given before the cross, before the new covenant came into being. And then we have some information after the cross, after this new covenant went into effect. The covenant in which God says he remembers our sins no more and where these have been forgiven, there's no longer any sacrifice for sin. In that new covenant, he tells us this, that we're to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So the Lord's Prayer you ask to be forgiven based on your willingness and your act to forgive others. That's a condition. In this new covenant, we simply forgive because God in Christ has already forgiven our sins. Yeah. So as a believer in Christ, you are a forgiven person. All of your sins have been forgiven. That person that has offended you, Christ has already taken care of their sins. So based on the shed blood of Christ, you can extend forgiveness to that one that has wronged you. Colossians 3.13, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Yeah. So in the old covenant, forgiveness was conditional. Mm -hmm. In the new covenant, it is unconditional and complete. So here's the question. Which covenant do you live in as a believer in Christ? Well, it's not the old. Jesus completed that, fulfilled it through his death on the cross. When he cried out, it is finished, he put an old to the end, and he ushered in the new. You're a new covenant believer. You have been forgiven. You have received forgiveness for every single sin that you will ever commit, that you've ever committed, yeah. that you will ever commit. It is unconditional. It's complete. You are a forgiven person. Now, based on that forgiveness, extend grace, kindness, and forgiveness to those who have wronged you. Absolutely. That's good news about a hard passage. And, of course, it is our Friday edition. We're considering hard passages. And uh, we want to remind you that so many of you, our friends, have stepped up to, uh, to help keep basic gospel on the air. And if you haven't, uh, we urge you to join with us now. There are countless others who need to hear the good news of the finality of the cross of Jesus Christ and the reality of his life in us who believe and we who believe. By the way, to say thanks for your gift uh, to Basic Gospel, uh, 
we're going to send you a special gift to help you uh, in your daily walk with the Lord Jesus. Again, just click donate at basicgospel.net or go and uh, use the phone 844-322-2742. That number is available 24 hours a day, weekend, night. It doesn't matter. You can call that number anytime and uh, pledge your gift. Again, 844-322-2742 or at basicgospel.net. We love the partnership of you, our listeners, and we hope that many of you who have not joined us yet will do so very, very soon. Well, our next passage is out of the book of Matthew, and it has to do with wine and wineskins. And uh, it's kind of an interesting passage. And when you read it, you scratch your head and think, what in the world is Jesus talking about? And Richard, you've done a lot of research on this. You have a great perspective, not on wine and wineskins, <laughs> but on the meaning of, of the passage. So yeah. walk us through this uh, difficult passage and, and, and inform us as to exactly what Jesus was saying when he brought wine and wineskins together in this verse. Sure. So the verse is uh, Matthew nine seventeen, and it says, Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. If that's the only verse you ever heard come from Jesus' mouth, you should quite properly say, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> you know, because just hanging there in, yeah. in midair, it, it means nothing. So let's take a look. As you've heard from us many, many times in this, this current series, we always look at context. And then there's something else we're going to look at today in that the Bible always explains itself. Bob just demonstrated that in talking about forgiveness, which is it before the cross or after the cross. So here's the context. This statement is in the middle of several short stories that Matthew told in order to show how and why Jesus is so likely to be found in the company of tax collectors and sinners. That was a big deal, and and we'll see why. So in verses 1 through 8, Jesus heals a paralytic, but first he tells him, your sins are forgiven. Uh, This story parallels um, Mark 2 and Luke 5, where they tore the, the roof apart and let this guy down. The, the teachers of the law just went bonkers over this. They, they accused him of blasphemy, and that's because only God can forgive sins. They were absolutely right in that. Only God can forgive sins. So if Jesus is claiming to forgive sins, he's claiming to be God. Yeah. Oh, no. So what Jesus did <laughs> to demonstrate his ability to do both, to heal the body and the soul and spirit, he healed the, the man of his of his paralysis and forgave his sins. Mm -hmm. And then Matthew leaves the story right there and jumps immediately into another similar story. Verses 9 through 12 is the story of Matthew's own call out of the tax collector booth to be a, a disciple of Jesus. And he walks away from his job and is so thrilled to be with Jesus that he throws a party. And so there, there are the Pharisees, always hanging around on the outside throwing stones. And again, they were shocked because, as they put it, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus replied, it is the healthy who need a doctor. It isn't the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And by extension, I'm that doctor. And I haven't come to call the righteous but sinners because the Pharisees saw themselves as righteous and everyone else as sinners. Oh, by the way, no one is righteous. I'm here to help. And they didn't want that help. Then in verses 14 through 17, where our passage comes from, John's disciples, John the Baptist, asked, why don't Jesus' disciples fast like we and the Pharisees do? Jesus had an answer for that. He said, well, the guests of the bridegroom don't mourn when he is with them. Well, I'm the bridegroom. And that, that begins to suggest something else, and we'll see that in a minute. But the time will come, he said, when I will be taken from them, then they will fast. Well, he's talking about his, his crucifixion. And then they'll be sad, and there'll be reason to fast, but then the resurrection is coming. And then in verses 18 through 26, we hear about a dead girl and a woman who's, who's very sick. The Mosaic Law had very specific prohibitions against dealing with someone who was bleeding and against touching dead people. So what did Jesus do? (laughs) He's heading to help this man's daughter, and this woman who was very sick touches him. 
He feels the power leave his body. He turns around. He asks the question, who touched me? And she's, of course, shocked. He has this conversation with her and says, you're healed. Because she was right there healed. And then he goes to this guy's house, and he actually touches the dead body. He takes the girl by the hand and says, get up. And she does. These stories are about the untouchables. And what does wine have to do with it? Well, first, as we've talked about previously, and Bob was just mentioning, Jesus worked and lived under the law. Paul tells us in Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. So it would make perfect sense for Jesus to teach the law, to explain the law and what it really meant, and and to explain why we can't survive under the law. Second, Jesus came to fulfill the law in his own words, Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. There was something else Jesus did. Notice we're using the Bible to explain the Bible. Jesus also proclaimed or prophesied the coming new covenant. This story, these collections of stories, is one of those times. He's talking about a complete change in reality from being under law to being under grace. Therefore, um, when he talks about new cloth and old cloth, which is the previous example before the wineskins, and the new wine in old wineskins, he is describing the futility of trying to mix the old covenant with the new. If you put unshrunk cloth on old cloth to fix a hole, and then you wash the clothes, the new cloth will shrink, tear away from the old cloth, and make the hole worse. And now you've got a worse problem than you had before. If you put new wine in old wineskins, you have to understand how they dealt with wine in those days. They would pour the raw grape juice into a wineskin, usually a skin of an animal, a stomach or something like that that had been cleaned. Well, the wine expands as it ferments. It's under pressure, and the skin expands. Well, after it expands and the wine is done and you've drunk the wine, if you then put new wine into that old skin, the skin will tear rather than to, than to expand. And now you've destroyed both. So what he's talking about here is that he's trying to model grace to the very people the religious leaders rejected as beneath their notice. I mean, we're better than them. Why are we wasting our time? That was their approach. These so-called losers craved a relationship with someone who cared. Jesus cared. He loved them. He loves us. This relationship is possible only under the new covenant. Adding law to the equation ruins everything. So in this passage, Jesus is prophesying the coming new covenant. And we know the new covenant went into effect when he died. So when he died, he had fulfilled the law, no longer bring forward the law into the new covenant. It will just ruin everything. The law was good. It is good. It brings you to Jesus. But once you've come to Jesus and entered the new covenant, the law is done. Do not mix the two. Yeah. That's good stuff. It is good stuff, and uh, we're considering hard passages on uh, this edition of Basic Gospel, as we do each Friday. And if you have a troublesome passage and would like to hear a discussion of it, why we encourage you to drop us a line at, uh, basic, at bob at basicgospel.net. And uh, you can message us also on our Facebook page. And uh, any of those ways, uh, we'll get your hard passage question to us. And, uh, again, you can phone it at uh, 844-322-2742. You can use email, as I said, but uh, send it to bob at basicgospel.net or message it to us at, uh, at uh, the Basic Gospel Facebook page. We would love to hear from you and get your hard passage. Well, thanks, Bob. Our next next passage is out of the book of Hebrews. And uh, so if, if we're forgiven in this new covenant, God remembers our sins no more. Uh, the old covenant has served its purpose and is no longer... Uh, really involved in our day-to-day lives. It it has been set aside, and now we're being led by the Spirit of God. What about this idea of discipline? What happens to us when we sin? Does God still punish us for those sins? And the idea of that comes from this particular passage in Hebrews. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 6, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So in this world, we're going to experience all kinds of trials and tribulations. And we have a Father who loves us, who lives inside of us, who has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. He is with us every step of our journey. And he is always teaching us and disciplining us. He's always there with us. And we need to look at that as a very positive thing. And that's what this verse is trying to teach us. Now, this is a quote from the Old Testament, Proverbs 3, 11 through, 7, or 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. So it's a very positive verse. Yes. He disciplines those he loves. Man, if God's discipline disciplining you, or if God's disciplining me, I need to take great comfort in that. He loves me. That's just proof positive that he loves me. And it also says in Proverbs, the son he delights in. He delights in us. He delights in you as one of his children. Now, what makes this passage troublesome is not the way these two translations render this particular passage, but the way the NIV, the NASB, and the King James Version have rendered this passage. So, for example, the NIV and earlier versions uh, said it like this, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he punishes every son whom he receives. Well, there's that word punish. Yeah. Well, that changes the tenor, the context of, of the meaning of this particular passage. So every time I sin, God punishes me when I sin. That's what somebody would take from that. I thought Jesus took the punishment for our sins. Well, that's the truth. Jesus took the punishment right. for all of your sins. There's no punishment left for you. So what do you conclude about that NIV rendering? It's dead wrong. Yeah. And it was so dead wrong that translators in the, in the most recent version of the NIV corrected their mistake. And they simply say that the Lord disciplines, he chastises every son whom he loves. So punishment, we need to realize that punishment looks back and acts to balance the books of justice. Well, Jesus did that at the cross. Yes. He paid all debts in full. They reconciled the world unto himself. Uh, both accounting documents have been cleared, zeroed out on both sides of that equation. So there's no debt. Jesus has, has, has balanced the books of justice. Discipline, on the other hand, looks forward. So punishment looks back. Mm -hmm. Discipline looks forward and acts to produce a harvest of righteousness. Now, that's what this passage is all about. It's about producing a harvest of righteousness. So what does this word chastise actually mean? It, it means to bring up a child, to educate in order to conform to divine truth. So this is a very loving passage. Now, sometimes that education feels uh, pretty tough. Well, and I think the reason it feels pretty tough is, uh, is, is because God goes to the very heart of the matter. He doesn't put Band-Aids on problems. He goes to the very heart. Why? Because there is where the real cultivation is going to take place. Right. There is where this harvest of righteousness is going to begin. And I think that's what the Old Testament writers had in mind. This word in Hebrew means to inquire deeply within, to cultivate. Well, that's exactly what God does. He cultivates our hearts in order that... A, a harvest of righteousness can be produced in and through us. Yes. That's good news. That is great news. And, of course, we're glad that you've joined us for these Friday editions where we're considering hard passages. And if you have one, drop it to us at bob at basicgospel.net. Keep in mind also, my friends, that uh, Basic Gospel is listener-supported, so we need your partnership with us. Please join us with your gift to Basic Gospel today, if possible, by clicking Donate at basicgospel.net or by calling 844-322-2742. 
Again, that's donate at basicgospel.net or by phone at 844-322-2742. Back to hard passages for just a moment. Drop yours to us at bob at basicgospel.net or you can go to our Facebook page, the Facebook channel, and uh, you can post it there. Well, thanks for joining us for this edition of Basic Gospel, everybody. Now for Bob Christopher, for Richard Piper, and all the ministry team, Bob Davis saying God bless you. We'll be back uh, for another edition live on Monday. I hope you'll join us. Bye-bye.